Happy Saturday, everybody. This week, we are putting out our unearthed episodes for the first quarter of 2021. And to whet everyone's appetites, we thought that we would replay an episode that is related to one of the things we're going to talk about. That's the Antikythera mechanism, which we first covered on the show on July 29th, 2013. So enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And depending on your definition of a computer, the subject of today's podcast could qualify as the oldest that we know of. And this story has all the makings of a good thriller. There's a shipwreck, there's a mysterious device that's kind of out of place in time, and there's actually an ongoing debate over the origin of it and who built it in the first place. Uh, And it's been studied extensively, but even so, uh, it still holds this sort of level of mystery about it. Yeah. Maybe aliens is one of those things that people like to say. Yeah, but not very many serious scholars go along. (laughs) Serious scholars do not generally blame things on aliens. They have a couple of theories that are, you know, hold some water, but it's still up for debate. Right. Uh, I mostly said the maybe aliens thing because it is cool and weird enough. Yeah, it's odd. It's definitely an oddity in the context of the time in which it was made, at least as far as we know. Right. So what this thing is, uh, how this whole story really starts, it actually starts 2,000 years ago. But where modern historians picked it up was in 1900. Uh, And at that time, a shipwreck was discovered near the island of Antikythera by a sponge diver and his crew. So this is like off the coast of Greece. And the ship that they discovered had been carrying an assortment of luxury goods when it sank. So bronze and marble statues, silver coins, glassware, jewelry, Rhodian vases, and several other things, but all pretty much luxury goods. In with all those other treasures, the divers brought up a rusted bronze mass. In 1902, while studying the artifacts, archaeologist Valerio Stace identified what he thought was a corroded gear wheel. Further examination revealed that there were dozens of individual broken pieces in the mass and that they were part of some sort of clockwork-style mechanism. Along with all those other pieces that were retrieved through the years, 81 different fragments have been identified as part of this mystery object. And at the time of the findings analysis there in the early 1900s, it was dated to approximately 150 BCE. That date has shifted a little bit with additional analysis to being, sometimes it's listed as closer to 100 BCE, sometimes 50 BCE. Uh, And in the 1970s, famous diver and deep sea explorer Jacques Cousteau found uh, coins at that same site that date the shipwreck to around 85 BCE. Uh, Although it's believed that the device probably existed for as long as two decades before the sinking. So depending on whose analysis you look at, it's somewhere between 150 BCE and 50 BCE, which is really a pretty small time frame when you consider how far back we're looking. That's a pretty pinpointed narrow range. Right. So for a long time, no one really knew what this was for. I mean, it was just a pile of rusty broken parts. Yeah. Uh, some of them were rusted together. Many. So, you know, not, not really easy to determine what, what it was meant to do. It's believed to have possibly originated on the island of Rhodes, which has a historical reputation for making automata and other mechanical artistry as well as an advanced knowledge of astronomy in the context of the time the ship was believed to have been traveling. The dozens of broken elements uh, pieced together would form dozens of dials that interlocked and moved together in a fairly complex layered mechanism. In modern hands, the artifacts have had an interesting history, and they've continually challenged the people who have studied them. So as early as the 1950s, researchers and enthusiasts were actually attempting to replicate the Antikythera. Uh, You know, they could tell that there were gears and cogs and they were trying to figure out what exactly it was for. And some of them took the approach of, well, let's try to build a replica of it and they will reveal what it's for. But there was always this gap in the information of how the mechanism worked because so many pieces were corroded together uh, that there was never really any big success along those lines. 
1971, two scientists used X-rays and gamma rays to further analyze the fused but fragmented mechanism. Their names were Dr. DeSella Price and Dr. Kara Carlos. Their work brought to light some of the complexity that the mechanism had. Uh, it, it really shed some light on just how many pieces and gears that were within this lump that they had solidified and rusted into. But even so, it was hard for them to make out individual pieces with any kind of specificity. So Dr. DeSala Price developed a model of how he believed the mechanism worked. But it couldn't account for all the pieces because the depth of the arrangement of gears just wasn't clear from all of their imaging work. There was also an Australian researcher named Alan George Bromley who took more x-rays and did a little bit more analysis, but he really felt strongly that new approaches to imaging were going to need to be developed if they were ever going to truly gain an understanding of this mechanism's workings. At this point, a former curator at the Science Museum in London named Michael Wright developed a specialized linear tomography machine that he was going to use to capture more thorough images of the Antikythera mechanism's inner workings. And in linear tomography, X-ray images are collected while the X-ray tube actually moves through a range of positions. So you end up with a series of exposure angles, and it gives you a more comprehensive data set for analysis of an object. And he actually kind of built this on site where the Antikythera was kept because they had to kind of custom build it to handle this one thing. You should also remember his name. He has a long and heavy involvement on research with the device. Yeah, he's uh, very famously connected to the Antikythera. So then there uh, there continued to be study throughout the um, late 1900s. And then in 2005, there were a batch of new pieces found. And this sort of catalyzed a consortium to come together to try to finally form a conclusive analysis of this device's workings and purpose. So along with Hewlett Packard and X-Tech Systems, uh, Cardiff University, the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and the National Archaeological Museum of Athens all joined forces to get to the bottom of this mystery. Like they were like, we're never going to figure this out on our own. Let's all put our, our resources and our minds together and see what the heck this thing actually is. So in September of 2005, Hewlett-Packard was able to take a series of reflectance imaging photos of the pieces of the mechanism. So this is a process that captures repeated images of a surface under different lighting conditions. Then that reveals details that we might otherwise miss. The machine was custom built to do all this imaging, and it reportedly cost about half a million dollars to build. Uh, Hewlett Packard actually still has many of the images of the Antikythera uh, in an interactive online gallery, and it is super duper cool. So you can actually look at how the different lighting affects the details that you can see and you can play with sliders and look at it and see like what it would look like non-corroded metallic finish uh and we'll link to that in the show notes because it's very fun to play with but warning you're going down a rabbit hole (laughs) you could lose an hour or two very easily x-tech brought a 12-ton microfocus computerized tomographer to the party and it was able to complete internal composition models of the pieces in really great detail So in November of 2006, Athens actually hosted a conference dedicated to the Antikythera entitled Decoding the Antikythera Mechanism, Science and Technology in Ancient Greece. And at this conference, the detailed findings of that analytical consortium were revealed to the world. And their analysis had identified that all of those cogs and pieces and pointers and knobs were part of what they were calling a fairly complex analog computer. Uh, And this was kind of groundbreaking information because these were mechanisms that were at a level of complexity that the historical record has no equal to until like a thousand years later. So it was a really extraordinarily complex mechanism, particularly in the context of the time it was dated to. But then comes the question of, but what does that analog computer compute exactly? So So then we get to make a replica. Yeah, so... Remember Michael Wright from before? Yes. He factors in really hugely at this point. In 2008, Michael Wright, who was working in his workshop in Hammersmith, 
completed this major labor of love that he'd been working on for years. And that is the replica of the Antikythera mechanism. And it works beautifully. It really does. He used brass rather than bronze for most of the project. Yeah, so he had been working on this with those teams from like the 70s on through. So decades of his life that he had kind of dedicated to this. Uh, And when you see it, it's sort of breathtaking. There is a knob at the side of the mechanism. And when it's turned by a user, it sets in motion the movement of multiple dials on this impressive little machine. And inside, there are more than 30 gear wheels. But it's a really fine example of an intuitive user interface. Because to use it, you don't see any of the complex mechanisms on the inside. You just have to turn this knob and seamlessly and smoothly all of these different dials turn and show you different information. Just as on the original machine, all the gears inside the replica have triangular teeth. Some of them have as few as 15 teeth and others have as many as 223. Each piece on the original artifact would have been hand cut from a sheet of bronze. So the front of the mechanism includes pointers that feature the Greek zodiac, the location of the moon, and the five planets that the Greeks knew about. So that's Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and an Egyptian calendar. And this front dial is actually two separate dials, one that sits within another. And the inner ring includes the zodiac, and the outer ring is a 365-day calendar. And when the knob is turned, the device predicts the motions of the heavens. So when you select a date on the calendar by turning the knob, the heavenly bodies on their respective pointers will rotate into their expected positions in the sky for that date. Which is pretty awesome. I literally kind of get chills just talking about it. Yeah. Because it's mind-blowing. It's really astounding. There's more information even than that on the back, on two dials that are stacked one above the other. The top dial displays a 19-year, 235-month calendar, and it marks, among other things, the scheduling of the Olympic Games, which is kind of a cool little... um, function for it to have. Uh, And it features individual months that are marked out along the exterior ring of the dial. The bottom dial shows a solar calendar of 76 years, including a predictive model of lunar and solar eclipses. And what's really sort of interesting about this little analog computer is its size. It's like the size of a shoebox. It's really quite small. So when you think about all the things it can do by turning one single knob... That's why I said it's kind of a beautifully simple user interface, considering that all of those moving parts inside are predicting all of those things at the same time. Again, mind-blowing. Yes. (laughs) I feel like it's a tiny shoebox version of that massive planetarium thing. It kind of is. Inside, like, Audrey's house in the Dark Crystal. Uh, And that brings up the question of just who made this amazing mechanism? Not gelflings. No. No. And the short answer to the question is almost that, though. We don't know. We don't know. It could have been gelflings. Sure. Not really. No. (laughs) But there is a longer answer. Yeah, the longer answer is because of the other relics on board and the location of the shipwreck, uh, which held the device, as we mentioned early on, historians have sort of considered that it may have originated on roads. And there's additional evidence to support that theory. The famed Greek astronomer Hipparchus is believed to have worked on the island of Rhodes from around 140 BCE until his death in 120 BCE. So for 20 years, he was there. Uh, And later, Posidonius, uh, who was a philosopher and a follower of Hipparchus, actually set up an astronomy school there at Rhodes. In the writings of Cicero, the first century BCE Roman lawyer and consul, a reference to the mechanism made by Posidonius is made, quote, which at each revolution produces the same motions of the sun, the moon, and the five planets that take place in the heavens every day and night. This has, of course, led many to believe that the device is the work of Posidonius or another Hipparchus follower. And supporting this belief is the fact that when uh, imaging gave us clearer views of the interior workings, uh, the ratios of two of the gear wheels within the device produce a motion that very closely mimics the way Hipparchus described the varying motion of the moon around the Earth. 
which had not happened prior to him, I don't believe. But that's not the only story that has um, some weight behind it in terms of potential origin. The month names inscribed on the object were only used in certain parts of northwestern Greece and Sicily. This calendar would have been used in the Sicilian city of Syracuse, home to Archimedes. Since Archimedes, who is a mathematician and astronomer, was known to have built some astronomical models and mechanisms of his own, some historians want to attribute the Antikythera to him. However, because Archimedes was killed at the siege of Syracuse in 212 BCE, that puts his death several decades before the machine is believed to have been built. Some scholars still feel that the machine could be part of a tradition that perhaps descended from Archimedes and his work. But the jury's still out. The origin, there's no definitive accepted origin story for it. But those are the two pack leaders. And then, of course, the alien theorists, but they don't really have any. Yeah, I was kidding. Science when I said or that. history to back that one up. I was also kidding when I said <laughs> gelflings. <laughs> Only a little. <laughs> uh, but then this all makes me ponder, and I think many other people. So where does this bizarre, wonderful thing fit into history? And why haven't we seen more of these kinds of computing artifacts? And there is a woman named Joe Marchant who has written a great deal about um, the um, the Antikythera. And she even wrote a book about it called Decoding the Heavens. But in an article that she wrote for Nature, she made the following quote that I really enjoyed. And it was, More surprising to an observer from the progress-obsessed 21st century is the apparent lack of a subsequent tradition based on the same technology, of ever better clockwork spreading out around the world. How can the capacity to build a machine so magnificent have passed through history with no obvious effects? So yeah, was this wondrous creation just a one-off of an especially gifted engineer who wanted to show off some extremely amazing skills? Or is it really the only surviving piece of a part of history we've somehow not ever found other evidence of? Uh, and Michael Wright, who we referenced before, that is really quite famous for making this beautiful replica, uh, gave a quote to the BBC in 2006 where he said, and he said it similarly in other interviews, the designer and maker of the device knew what they wanted to achieve and they did it expertly. They made no mistakes. To do this, it can't have been very far from their everyday stock work. And he, I watched late in the game after we had prepped all of our show notes, another interview with him where he was saying, normally if you look at historical clockworks, you can almost see where the plan was amended or the clockmaker kind of changed his mind about how something was going to function, but there are no such apparent changes in this. It really is all put together beautifully with no, it doesn't look like there was ever any editing to the plan. Yeah. So most researchers agree with Wright that this couldn't have been a -a one-of-a-kind object. One explanation for why we haven't found anything else like this piece is that it just survived almost entirely by blind luck. I mean, it is more than 2,000 years old. Yes. It's a long time for... uh, you know, for for something to survive, especially considering that bronze and other metals at the time were really frequently melted down to make other objects. But this sank to the bottom of the sea, and it remained relatively intact there. For context, the Athens Museum has only 10 major bronze statues from ancient Greece, nine of which are from shipwrecks. Yeah, bronze really was... So often in high demand and short supply. So if it was something that wasn't needed any longer or had fallen into disrepair, uh, which, you know, these clockworks would presumably have needed upkeep. Melt it down. Yeah, make something new. We need it for other things. That I that might be a tradition we <laughs> should revive ourselves. <laughs> uh, and while examples of other mechanisms that model the movement of heavenly bodies have been found that are uh, closer to the time it's believed that this existed, none of them are anywhere near as detailed or sophisticated as the Antikythera. It's, as I said earlier, not until the 14th century that even comparable clockworks start to appear. The three largest fragments of this mechanism are on display at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, Greece. And the smaller pieces of it are in storage at the museum. 
study of the Antikythera continues. I, I don't think anybody believes the book is closed on this one. Uh, there are still conferences and symposia that are held to discuss its place in history and its origin. And the last one was quite recent. It was June of 2013, so just a few weeks ago, really. Uh, and it was a workshop to bring together classicists, astronomers, archaeologists, mathematicians, and historians. And they all had the goal of discussing science and innovation in antiquity around the theme of the Antikythera mechanism. So I'm hoping we get lots of interesting papers to come out of that group think. Uh, and there's also continuing analysis of the inscriptions on the mechanism in case there are any new revelations that people haven't necessarily identified yet. And then in 2010, another fully functional replica was built, this time out of Lego. Naturally, it looks quite a bit different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not a true replica. Right. But the function of each dial is faithfully duplicated using Lego. And there's even a neat video that uh, explains how the mathematics of the gears work, how they combine to perform the same functions as the Brond artifact does. And we will link to that in our show notes, too. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's one of those things that I really, it really is breathtaking. There, in several of the links that will appear in our show notes, there is a, a video that was done by, I believe, the New Scientist. And it's Michael Wright kind of giving a demonstration of it and turning the crank and you can see all the wheels move and how beautifully, imp it's smooth as silk. I mean, there's no awkward chunking along. It's really, really, it seems almost magical. Yeah, which considering how many things... <laughs> That are just much simpler, you have to fiddle with. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's it's really beautiful. Like the key to my front door has to be <laughs> jostled to work. And exactly. And this is a very complex machine. It's much more difficult than the key to my front door. Built entirely replicating the specs of this two thousand year old object and it works perfectly and beautifully and is so smooth. It's really quite astounding. Ah, oh, the Antikythera. Yeah. Oh, I have like romantic attachment to it because I, it's so amazing. I think that's valid. <laughs> it's And I think I'm not the only one. There are lots of people. Anytime you see interviews with people that study it, they sort of have that like giddy slash wistful combination where they're just, they're still blown away by it, even if they've been working with it and the data sets for decades. It's yeah. really quite cool. So that's the Antikythera mechanism. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 